Thanks everyone. It's great to see so many people here taking uh, such an interest in what I think is an incredibly uh, important issue. Coal seam gas will, um, I think one thing we've got to realise is that coal seam gas will not provide many jobs in the Illawarra region. We're talking about a peak of about 12 construction jobs for what's proposed at the moment. But it will have, it will cost a lot of jobs in the Illawarra region. Um, that is because the, the coal seam gas industry actually crowds out jobs in other sectors of the economy and particularly in sectors like manufacturing, tourism and education which are bedrock industries in the Illawarra region. The recent job losses, the recent blue scope job losses were, were largely as a result of the increase in the Australian dollar which is fueled by the resource boom and the coal seam gas industry is a big part of that resource boom. So that's a really that's a, a really core cool thing to understand. Just a little bit about um, the Australia Institute. We're a um, we're a, a not-for-profit research and education organisation funded by donations from some philanthropists and also members who are very people um, like yourselves who support this kind of research. And, um, and become members of, of the Australia Institute. We do research into a wide range of uh, social, environmental and economic issues. And it's usually, whatever we're talking about, usually has a fairly strong economic slant. We have a, a number of economists that are employed as researchers. And our emphasis is really on trying to present what's fairly, often fairly complex material in kind of jargon-free, plain language that people can understand. Um, we've done one of the streams of our research is on mining and gas issues, coal and gas issues in particular, and we've done a number of reports um, on that over the last 12 months. Uh, probably the, the main one is the, is the Mining the Truth report that uh, Chris mentioned before, and we've got available outside, but we've also done a number of reports that, um, that are specifically on coal seam gas and, and coal. So. Uh, they're, they're all available on our website and I can give you more details later. The reason I think it's so important, well, well actually I'll phrase that another way, we're all here because, or well, people, in, I, I imagine people generally here because their concern is about environmental issues, uh, water issues and the impact on communities. And these are all absolutely the core, um, the core really important things that, we, that people should be concerned about. Because the coal seam gas boom is so enormous, it actually has enormous economic impacts as well. But the re reason that we really need to uh, address that is that the mining industry's main justification for what they do is the, is, is the um, purported economic benefits. So the narrative is something, in, in, the, in the public, is something like this. Yes, there's a whole lot of bad impacts of gas and, and coal extraction, um, but they can be managed and we need them because um, you know we need the jobs. So that's that's the sort of narrative that's out there at the moment. Now, um, now there's, uh, there's really good arguments to say that that's not the case and so I'm going to address some of those things today. The first thing I want to do though is to look at, is to just set the context Australia-wide of how big the how big the gas boom is and the coal boom because they're both about extracting um, coal and gas from coal seam, so I just want to put that into a bit of a national perspective. Uh, there, there are a huge amount of Australia that actually has coal seams under the ground, so petrified forests that, um, that, uh, that, that have been there for, for millennia. And as you can see, particularly on the east coast, they coincide a lot with um, you know, forested and, and good agricultural land. So you can see that's absolutely vast areas. Um, so a lot of that is, you know, is agricultural land and that's, those coal seams uh, have basically, they contain water, coal and methane gas. And the coal and the methane gas can both be burnt to produce electricity or, or um, energy for the industrial sector. So basically you burn them and they spin a turbine one way or another to produce electricity or you burn it for industrial processes. So that's what gives it its economic value. 
to actually uh, get the economic value out of that, you can do it one of two ways. You can dig up the coal and basically take it to a power station in Australia overseas and burn it, um, or you can drill down into the coal seams and you basically pull all the water out and that removes the pressure that's keeping the gas in the ground and that allows the gas to migrate up the wells and also migrates through other fissures and stuff as well, but up the wells and then it's piped out and taken to either a gas power plant in Australia or distribu distribution network or compressed into a liquid and exported overseas from um, Gladstone or some other, potentially some other LNG ports. So that's, that's kind of, um, <coughs> that's kind of the, I think it's often good to just come back to the reality of, of what we're talking about um, and just make, make that a bit explicit. Now the next issue is just the scale of what's happening and this, so I'm, I'm just going to use an example of the size of the expansion of the coal industry. Australia is the biggest coal exporter in the world at the moment and this is, Central Queensland is actually the biggest part of Australia for coal exports and they export at the moment about, or they mine about 180 million tonnes a year of coal and that's a huge amount of coal, it's about 60 very, very, well, varying sizes but often very large mines so by world standards um, that's actually huge and that that blue bar there represents those, those 60 existing coal mines in central Queensland. Over the next five years, there's another 60 mines, a lot of them much bigger, called mega mines, that are proposed uh, to be completed um, in central Queensland. So all of these mines are being constructed at once. Now with the drop in the coal price, some of them won't go ahead straight away. Uh, however, they're still looking for all their approvals and so they'll get all the approvals in place and when the coal price goes up again, those, more than likely those plants will, those coal mines will go ahead. Um, in terms of coal seam gas, at the moment we're the fifth largest exporter of liquefied natural gas uh, in the world. And we, all the gas we export is from um, Western Australia or the Northern Territory. We export about 20 million tonnes a year, so the fifth largest exporter. Over the next few years, um, the, these are all the projects that are going ahead and will be up around over 100 million tonnes um, pretty soon. And a lot of these projects are actually approved and under construction at the moment. So I guess the point I'm trying to make from an economic sense is that this is a massive thing happening in our economy. I mean, absolutely huge. So the impacts are going to be absolutely huge. Now, one of those one of those projects is this, this one, uh, GLNG, which is Santos Lead Project, Gladstone um, LNG. And I'm just going to use that as a little bit of a as a little bit of a case study to give a sense of what the infrastructure for that looks like. That's the that's the map of all their gas fields. So that's about a 350 kilometre drive that way, and about a 250 kilometre drive that way. So Brisbane's here, some big Gladstone's. Here, so that's vast areas, and there's four of these big gas projects in Queensland. This is actually the smallest of those projects. Uh, it's um, Santos Lead, that seven percent is owned by um, overseas multinationals, which is fairly typical of um, of the oil and gas industry in Australia. It will have um, it will have three of these massive LNG trains that are going to be on Curtis Island in a, an area excised from the World Heritage um, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. It will have 2,650 wells in the first train, but probably about 10,000 wells when all three trains are in place. It will cover 24,000 odd square kilometres. Um, there will be 450 big um, gas compression stations, uh, huge water treatment facilities, 20,000 odd kilometres of access roads, uh, 6,000 kilometres of water and gas um, gathering lines and a really big 435 kilometre pipeline from the gas fields to Gladstone. So that's just giving you a sense of the kind of infrastructure we're getting across the, um, you know, we're getting across Australia. And those four, um, those four projects combined will cover 100,000 square kilometres of Queensland and it will look like this, um, this is actually in Tara and the Darling Downs in Queensland 
So it'll be like that over 100,000 square kilometres. So just giving you a physical idea of, of what we're talking about. Th this is in the Pilliga State Forest, which is 80,000 hectares. That, that's in northern New South Wales. Um, that'll be entirely covered by an industrial gas grid that looks a bit like this, which I find, I was a bit shocked by that because it's a, an area of bush I really like, so, uh, so I couldn't quite believe that, that was going to happen. Um, some of the water treatment stuff is just, the, the infrastructure is absolutely enormous because the volumes of water are huge. Um, it's often very messy on the ground. This is an unlined uh, uh, water holding pond in the Pilliga, so um, water that comes up from the coal seam is full of heavy metals and BTEX chemicals and that is just drifting back into the, into the aquifers below the surface. Um, obviously laying out all the gas pipelines etc is hugely intrusive on farmlands and forests. And there's tens of thousands of kilometres of that. Uh, the big LNG plants in the World Heritage, um, Heritage Area on Curtis Island, uh, there's going to be three of these um, in, in, that, in that area, in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and a lot of dredging and stuff involved. And this is what, this is what your final LNG export plant looks like. I'll just put this one up to show, just to explain kind of how it works, which I think is sort of useful. Um, the gas gets piped in, and these things are called the LNG trains. And their pipes go through the, this, and it's basically like a big refrigerator, and it pulls the gas down to about um, minus 160 degrees, and turns it into a liquid, and then it gets um, and then it gets stored in these big tanks, and then piped out and put on one of those big LNG ships with the big kind of dome containers as a liquid and exported overseas. So that's just kind of giving you an idea of of um, how that works, because you couldn't export it as gas because you because it would be too big, too big an area. So, so that's just a bit about putting it into the, the context of the size of the boom. Um, now, uh, now I just want to talk specifically about the economic impacts of the boom. The first thing to note is that public perceptions of what's going on are very, actually very different to the reality. We did a bit of polling um, recently and we asked people how many, how much, what percentage of the Australian workforce they thought mining employed, and people generally thought it was around 20%, but actually, in reality, it's less than 2% of the Australian workforce. We asked people how much, of, how big a percentage of the Australian economy was in terms of GDP. They thought it was around 35%, but in fact, it's around about 10%, depending on the um, 10 to 14%, depending on the on commodity prices at any given time. And we asked them how much that they thought was, was foreign owned. And most people thought it was about 50% foreign owned. On average, it's about 83% foreign owned. So um, there's a lot of work to do with actually getting people to understand the reality of the boom because a lot of um, the mining industries, public relations, um, paints a very different picture to, to what the, the reality actually is. The, the, the main thing to note in terms of the, the key issue in terms of the economic impacts of the mining boom is the more mining you have, the less you have of everything else. And that's, kind of, that's known as the crowding out effect or the hollowing out effect of, on, on the economy. Um, it mostly impacts industries, most of it only impacts, or well, the impact is most severe on industries that, act, that it export. And, the, and those industries are primarily education, manufacturing, tourism and agriculture. And obviously three of those are bedrock industries for the Illawarra. Um, particularly, uh, well, all three of them are actually really, really important. Um, the, the, it does it in two ways. The first way is that it drives up the Australian dollar. And the reason it does that is that uh, a huge amount of money, there's something like a $400 billion investment pipeline for the resource industry in Australia. And so that's $400 billion worth of Australian dollars being bought. And also Australian commodities are sold overseas in Australian dollars. And both of those things put a huge demand on Australian dollars. Uh, there's also, additional to that, there's the um, pressure on interest rates because the resource boom forces the economy to overheat a bit and to cool it down and to make room for the resource boom, interest rates actually are a bit higher than they otherwise would be and that encourages people to, to invest
invest in Australia as well, so in Australian dollars as well. So it, it drives up the Australian dollar, and we have what's called a commodity currency. So fluctuations in our currency are linked to fluctuations in commodity prices. So in, say, 2002, if I was making something in Australia that I was selling in the US for $70, uh, well, if I was making something, if I could sell something in the US for $70, that same um, manufactured thing that I'm making might be steel from a, might be a steel product from Blue Scope or it might be a, you know, a washing machine or something like that. That same, that same object will now cost about $105 in the US. And, we, and our dollar has risen against a raft of other currencies as well. Okay, so, so that is an incredible hit on anyone exporting from Australia. It's not only manufacturing, it's not only, and, and obviously, I mean, obviously you need to, if, you, if your goods are 30% more expensive than they were um, eight years ago, you obviously have to drop your price considerably and it's much harder to compete with other, with, other, with your other exporters from different countries. Now that doesn't just apply to goods, it's also holidays overseas. So, so holidays in Australia are relatively more expensive and as we know people make their decisions on, on where they holiday uh, largely on the basis, the basis of the value they get. So if Australia becomes 30% more expensive, you're likely to get, you're likely to get a, lot more, um, a lot less people coming here. Uh, similarly with foreign students, so the foreign education sector is huge and Wollongong University has a lot of um, overseas students and it's much more expensive for them to come here now as well. Uh, just to give you an idea of, with the tourism example, um, the, the net, tourism, net, net arrivals over departures just means that um, people coming to Australia, it's, it's the people who choose to come to Australia minus people uh, leaving Australia, so it's the it's the it's the net net arrivals over departures. That's the Australian dollar rising since two thousand and two, and that's the net arrivals over departures, which has dropped by about um, three hundred thousand people per year in, in that time. Uh, when we take a big step back and look at the overall impact on the economy. This is, this is mining exports, the blue line is mining exports as a percentage of Australian GDP and the red is a basket of all the other, uh, of all the non-mining, of all of our non-mining exports. So you can see when the boom started uh, around a bit after 2000, mining um, exports have climbed and everything else has declined. So that's, that's the overall creating out effect. And essentially, this represents our diversified economy. Okay, so it was doing really well till about 2000, and it's just trended pretty steadily downwards ever since. So that is a shift from a diversified economy to a resource-dependent economy. Uh, the other big thing that we need to take into account is volatility, because even because the dollar goes up and it goes down, so that's um, you know, that's about six percent. Uh, the the blue is the Australian dollar, the red is commodity prices, so you can see how closely they're linked. Um, when you have wild fluctuations like this, okay, um, industries will close down when the Australian dollar is high for all those reasons I was talking about, but they can't just ramp up again. And when you think, you, you just kind of need to think through what's happening. If I'm building a car plant and I, um, you know, I have to, to get finance for that plant, it might cost me a billion dollars. I need to know, as part of my business plan, to get the finance, how much I'll be able to sell cars for to the US or Saudi Arabia or, or wherever else over the next 20 years. And if, if I've got wild fluctuations like that, it's very hard for me to make that investment in Australia. So the volatility, it's not just the fact that the dollar goes up, it's the volatility that also impacts, that means um, that, that actually detracts from our diversified economy and makes us much more dependent on, um, on, resource, on resource exports. Uh, mining, I showed you before people, there's a big misperception about mining, people think um, it employs about 20% of the economy, and of, of, sorry, of the workforce, and it actually employs about 
2%. That's mining relative to other industries. So you can see manufacturing is, is far, far more important employer than, than mining. Uh, there's about 200,000 people employed in mining in Australia. There's about 900,000 in, in manufacturing. Uh, the coal industry employs about 60,000 people, which is less than half of 1% of the workforce, and the gas industry is significantly less than that. Just, just another way of representing it, the, the black area is all the people who don't work in mining. <laughs> the, um, the, the, the growth, during the mining boom, the growth in employment of Australia, in Australia, the growth, is represented by the big one. And the growth in employment in the mining sector is represented by the small ones. So the jobs haven't been coming, um, you know, for the most part from the mining sector during that period. Uh, now, during the, uh, the GFC, there is a bit of a perception out there that, that well, there's a comment you'll hear often in the mining that we've started just from GFC. The former Treasury Secretary, Ken Henry, who was the Treasury Secretary for uh, 10 years, said after the mining boom that within six months of the mining boom, well, he can say this, he pointed it out, that the mining industry dropped 15.2% of its workforce. If all industries had behaved that way, we would have had 19% unemployment within six months of the GFC, but the rest of the industries didn't. They held on to their employees because they're much longer term, whereas the mining industry just ramps up and down relative to the prices it's getting for its commodities. Um, the mining industry, relative to other industries, is a small tax, is a is a much smaller tax payer. The uh, the corporate, the theoretical corporate tax rate is thirty percent, but all most industries, well, I think all industries actually pay less than that because they they get a number of um, tax deductions and, and sub direct and indirect subsidies. The uh, the mining industry just gets more than most, so the industry average is about twenty is about 21% uh, of, um, of their profits. For the mining industry, it's about 13.9%. And the main reason for that is that they get a huge amount of subsidies, at least $10 billion a year, which puts industries like the car industry to, to shame in terms of the amount of subsidies they're receiving. Um, big subsidies include the diesel fuel tax rebate, um, which is about, the value is about $2 billion a year, but there's huge, um, there's huge research and development uh, write-offs where mines, the actual operational phase of the mine can be treated as, as an R&D tax write-off and, um, and a whole bunch of others that um, we've, got, we've got plenty of research on that we can talk about too, but I'll, um, yeah, no worries. So I won't go into too much detail there, but you know, it's an industry that gets far more subsidies than any other industry in Australia by, by an absolute um, country wide. Uh, the other issue that there's a lot of misperceptions on is, is foreign ownership of, um, of the mining industry. So these are the different sectors of, of the mining industry. Um, and the black bit at the top is the degree, is the amount, is the proportion of those industries that's Australian owned. So oil and gas is relatively highly Australian owned, at about 83%, at about, about 17% Australian owned. And um, it polls, polls much, uh, is about 87% foreign owned. Now, what, what does, why does that matter? Um, you know, it's, it's fine for other countries to invest in Australia, but I think what we, what we need to just realise is that 87, that means 87% or 83% of the profits go offshore. So last, uh, the last time the figures were above, I think it was 2010, 2011, uh, the mining industry made $51 billion profit, $42 billion of that went to overseas shareholders. And in the next 10 years, they're expected to make $600 billion profit and over, that, over that period, and $500 billion will go to um, overseas shareholders. So, you know, it depends on how you think about it, but not necessarily a bad thing per se, but very different to, um, to public perception. Um, now, the, the, uh, we, uh, Australia measures its, measures its um, way in the world by um, a thing called the balance of payments. And the balance of payments is 
made up of two, two factors, or two parts, I should say. The first part is the amount of goods and services that we export overseas minus the amount of it that we import. So we either have balance of payments, so, so that can be either the surplus or deficit. At the moment, we're exporting a huge amount of resources, and that's actually in, that's actually, we're in the black on our goods and services exports, uh, largely because of that. So zero is here, so we're about, oh, you know, we're, we're a little bit in the black. But there's a second component to our balance of payments, and that is uh, the, that's our, our income. And what that is, is the amount of money Australian businesses, sorry, Australian residents earn from businesses overseas minus the amount that people, that residents overseas earn from businesses in Australia. So if the business is owned by someone overseas, the flow of income goes out of the country. And if the Australian owns an overseas business, the income flows into the country. And because mining is so overwhelmingly foreign owned and, and is, a, is so huge in terms of the amounts of money involved, uh, that is seriously dragging down our current account, our balance of payments. And so the overall, when you combine this and this, you get this dark black line, which is our current account, um, which is our balance of payments. And we currently have a current account deficit of, I think we're at around 2.5% at the moment, somewhere in that vicinity. This is what's projected by Treasury to happen over the next few years. So in the midst of the biggest commodity boom in Australia's history by a mile, where actually we actually have a, a large and increasing current account deficit. And it's expected that that will be at banana or public levels in, within the next few years. Industry often says, well, that's because we're investing, we're importing this machinery from overseas, um, and then it'll go up as we start exporting. But of course, as we start exporting, then that's increasing the income flow out of the country as well. And that's why it's projected to actually um, keep going down for the time. Just uh, quickly want to talk about because we've done a few we've done a few um, studies specifically relating to coal and gas, and the way we've done it is actually to take the company environmental impact statements because the companies actually have a section in there that says um, well here are the, they have to look at the economic benefits and, and negatives of what their project does, and so th these things like ten thousand pages long, so couldn't they? Reading that much, but we go through and actually look at what they're saying. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it's a very economic way to do research. <laughs> and have to footnote one document. And um, the, uh, so the Arrow LNG project, which is one of those massive um, coal seam gas projects in Queensland, a bit like the GLNG project, and this is the last one to be approved, the, it's still pending approval. Well, uh, sorry. It's still pending its um, final investment decision and approval, I think. Um, but similar scale, they're saying that it would cause a loss of 1,600 jobs across Queensland and Australia, a thousand of which would be in manufacturing. So that's their own, that's their own consultants um, saying it would, uh, it, it, we would lose $441 million worth of, you know, almost half a million dollars worth of manufacturing <coughs> activity and, and a bunch of other things as well. So. So the um, so each of these projects has that kind of impact, and it will create construct mostly construction jobs, but they have low ongoing operation and maintenance jobs after that. So those jobs in the coal and gas fields of Queensland are at the expense of steel jobs in the Illawarra and manufacturing jobs all over the country. <coughs>
that area will be once in a generation economic opportunity for the region. So we, we had a look at the report and um, it's quite a confused report so our, our paper on it kind of points out a lot of the contradictions. But basically the, um, this, was the, this was the jobs they were talking, saying they would, they would create and um, the, the, the actual direct gas jobs, there was about 30 direct gas jobs, um, a lot of, quite a lot of media jobs. <laughs> but the really interesting thing is from those 30 direct gas jobs, there's something like, there's something like 600 jobs in the, in, well sorry, about 500 jobs in the public sector. Which is, I don't know what they're doing, like <laughs> dealing with the environmental crush up or something like that. But anyway, kind of crazy stuff. But the point was very low ongoing jobs in, uh, it's, it's actually quite unclear whether they're saying there's 200 direct jobs or only 30, but you know, low ongoing jobs. You know, and if there's, even if there's 200 direct jobs from this, there's 66,000 jobs in the region, so, so it's not a um, And the, uh, and their modelling, Again, we had to kind of reverse engineer their modelling to figure it out. But on the on the basis of the figures they put out there, their um, th that project would actually uh, would actually crowd out about six hundred forty-six million dollars in, in other industries across Australia. And just using the kind of standard way, you figure out how many jobs that equates to. It was you know close to six thousand jobs. So we we actually think their their figures are a bit strange, but. But on their own report, the crowding out impact of just that sandbox thing was, was actually quite huge to, to other industries. Um, so, and, and you hear a lot about good economic management at the moment. Unfortunately, in Australia at the moment, I think good economic management is often equated with handing out um, approvals for projects like confetti, like just getting as many out the door as you can. And what I would say is that when we see the steep line of project approvals, and there's all sorts of problems with that, but from an economic perspective, the problem is that you're building all of these projects at once, so you're creating a skills shortage, which has um, really dire economic effects on other industries as well, and you're driving up the Australian dollar. So if you do, if you actually build, construct all these projects at once, you're in a sense exacerbating the, the crowding out impacts on the rest of the economy. And, I, and, I don't, and that is just, you know, it's a lot of things, that's, but, but one of the things it's not is, is good economic management. So the mining industry obviously has, you know, quite, um, quite uh, good advertising campaigns about, um, you know, um, you should probably see the ones about people on horses who work for the mining industry and stuff like that. And, um, and so they seem, you know, they're, they're quite powerful in their, in, their, in their messaging. But I think what people should remember is that the industries that are being seriously impacted by what's going on with resource burden at the moment employ a hell of a lot of people, and, and a lot more than the mining industry. So if these industries really wake up to the, what's, what's happening to them as a result of all this, uh, I think we, we actually have a lot of potential allies. Unfortunately, you know, the manufacturing industry complains things like the carbon tax, which will impact the industry to some extent, but it's tiny compared to the impact of the high strain and the skills shortage and those kinds of things. So it's a bit like they're, you know, these industries and tourism is a bit the same. They don't acknowledge that the high dollar is the thing that's really killing them. So it's a bit like they're putting out this little spot fire here with a massive wall of houses on fire, you know, behind them. So, I guess what we're trying to do is really just, just alert people to the real dynamics of what's going on in, in the economy. The last thing I would say, uh, the last thing I, I would say is just that um, I think what I think what uh, everyone here is doing and being involved with the Stop CSG campaign is just incredibly Stop CSG Illawarra campaign is incredibly important because what you're doing is telling the story of what's going on. Um, you know, what, what's happening here is, is you know, uh, will impact the water table and, and all sorts of things. We will have, you know, the local impacts are important, right? But this is a relatively small thing compared to the behemoth thing that's happening around the country. What's happening around the country is the biggest change 
to Australia that we've ever experienced. And it's going to change every aspect of the Australian economy, you know, where we work, what we do, um, our landscape, our environment, um, our community. So it's going to have really huge impacts. What you're doing by running such a, an incredibly successful campaign is not just relevant to what's going to happen up in the water catchment sphere, it's actually telling a wider story so that people around Australia start to understand some of the implications of what's happening on a national scale. So I'd just like to congratulate everybody for, um, for telling that story so well and um, thanks so much for having me here today to, um, to talk to you about the economics.